Today we uh, will be hearing from a really uh, significant passage that speaks of Christ's power to heal and to touch us uh, right where we live. We read today from uh, Mark, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 43. Ashley and I will be uh, reading this passage. So from Mark 25, I'm sorry, from Mark 5, 21 through 43, let's hear this from God's Word. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and, and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told, told him, do not be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He uh, took her by the hand and said, Tabitha Kaum, which means the little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is God's word, and may it be a deep and abiding blessing to each of us, not only as we hear this word read, but as we make effort now to take this word and apply it to our lives. May God bless us all. Amen. Well, everybody, at least in, in my household, likes uh, an Oreo. Everybody loves uh, an Oreo. There's just something about uh, two chocolate cookies with uh, cream on the inside. These things don't last very long around, uh, around our house. How you eat an Oreo is a matter of uh, great debate. Some will take an, an Oreo and they'll uh, twist it They'll uh, eat the cream and then the cookies. I'm sort of an eat-the-whole-cookie-at-one-time guy. That's who I am. That uh, debate has been raging ever since 1921 when Oreos were, were first on the market. Now, these Oreos are going to be in the uh, dessert uh, uh, line at our potluck dinner. And I want you to know that I even got the family size. <laughs> so here we go. We are going to have plenty of... Plenty of Oreos for, uh, for every, everybody. What do you like best? Do you like the, the cookies or do you like the cream? 
It's a matter of debate. Personally, I find that one enhances the other. Our scripture for today functions much like an Oreo cream sandwich, believe it or not. One part only makes the other better. Mark is famous for starting one story, then interrupting that story with another story, and then picking up the original story. Some scholars even call that a Mark and Sandwich. I bet you uh, never really knew that. That's a little bit of a helpful hint for a, a tr trivial pursuit question someday. A Mark and Sandwich. One story, then another, and then picking up the same story with which he began. Today we consider two stories. We read them as one. The first is the story of the healing of Jairus' daughter, and the other the healing of of a woman with a very serious hemorrhage. One sought the healing of uh, his 12-year-old daughter, while the other sought the healing of a 12-year-old disease. Jarius was desperate. His, his daughter was sick and close to, to death. He was willing to do anything to see that his daughter lived. We're the same way. We will do almost anything for our kids, particularly when it comes to their health and well-being. If you doubt that, just visit Children's Hospital downtown and look at the, the desperation on many of the faces of the parents there. In approaching Jesus as he did, Jairus had to lay down all sorts of things in order to really find himself able to communicate with, with Christ as he, as, he, as he needed to. Too much was at stake for him to have done otherwise. Jesus was, uh, or Jairus rather, was a, a leader in his uh, local synagogue. Approaching Jesus as he, as he did would have, would have put that in jeopardy. Those who consider themselves a, a part of the religious elite would have been, uh, would have been very upset with Jairus for approaching Jesus. His high standing in the synagogue very well may have been in jeopardy. Jairus also had to check his pride. Jairus had to, to, to check his fear. These things Jairus had to lay down in order to rightly communicate with, with Christ. We're the same way. We need to, to lay down our pride. We need to lay down our fear in order to really connect with our Lord. N.T. Wright, the great theologian, puts it this way. Jairus pockets his pride and forgets his fear. In the end, Jairus had to lay aside any doubts that he may have had so that he could have put his faith in Jesus. Again, that's the very place where he needed to be. Sandwiched in the middle of this great story about Jairus' daughter is the story of a woman who had an uncontrollable hemorrhage. She, too, was desperate. As we said, the woman's uh, hemorrhage had been with her for 12 years. She had tried everything, everything to get well, spent everything she had in the process, adding insult to injury. The woman had to face uh, daily derision on, on the part of others who were around her because she would have been considered unclean because of this issue of blood. In, the, in a word, the woman would have done anything, anything to be healed. Jairus pleaded with Jesus to come and heal his daughter. The woman with the hemorrhage simply came up to Jesus from behind and touched his cloak. Her faith was so strong, she figured that all she needed to do was touch the cloak of the garment he was wearing and be healed. She was right about that. Her faith was so strong, the point of connection so sure that that woman was healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well, has rung through the ages. There are some things that we can claim here as we, as we consider these two stories. First, both stories talk about the power of connection. 
Staying connected with Christ is the very place we need to be. Jairus asked Jesus to come and, and lay hands on his, on his daughter. The woman with the, the hemorrhage didn't even ask. She simply went up to Jesus and took it upon herself to just touch the, the cloak that he was wearing. The same effect was, uh, was for both. There was a point of contact, either Jesus reaching out and touching or the woman reaching out and touching Jesus. In, uh, in visiting the hospital, I have uh, come to, to know just how important the, the power of connection really is. You know, I'll visit people in, in all states of, uh, of, of, of uh, their illness. I've, I've even been with people who have been so weak that, that they're really very close to not being able to speak. But as I approach their bed, almost invariably, whether they, they find themselves in a very weakened condition or not, they'll always reach from under the covers, exposing their hand, and having me to then reach out and, and grab theirs. The power of connection. It's just that important, particularly when it comes to healing. The power of connection with one another. This is an age where there are so many ways to connect. Social media and the internet have broadened the horizon of connection more than at any other time in history. Let's face it, we're, we're able to connect with one another in ways that, that, that throughout history we've just not been able to do. And it seems as though we are as distant and as disconnected as we have ever been. The pandemic has only made things worse. Far too many have been way too isolated for way too long. We need to, to look for ways to connect with one another. When it comes right down to it, we were not, connect, we were not created to go it alone. The two stories that we're considering today are stories not only about the power of connection, but about the power of faith over doubt. It's interesting that in, in both stories, uh, the people involved sought out Christ in their desperation. Both individuals were desperate. It, it might be that, that you're feeling a bit desperate today as well. It may be that the, the, the circumstance of your life is, is, is feeling so dire that, that you, uh, you find yourself in that, that desperate state. Jesus stands to heal you as well. The persons involved in the two stories that we read today had, had nowhere else to turn, and in that was the beginning of their, of their healing. For in that was the very beginnings of, of faith, faith that would lead them to Jesus, faith that would lead them to be connected to Jesus, faith that would lead them to be healed. Sure, they must have had their doubts, but they laid all of those aside to encounter the miraculous power of Jesus. We all have doubts, every one of us. It, it's, it's a human thing to, to have doubts. Some really struggle with doubt to the, to the point that their doubts play havoc with their relationship with Jesus. These folk just can't seem to hurdle their doubts, which keep them from truly believing. The fact of the matter is that doubt has a way of either eroding our faith or catalyzing it. There is this positive turn to doubt that, that we become so unsettled in it that we begin to, to, to pursue Christ, begin to turn his way to get answers, to be filled, to, to have him uh, work in our lives, bringing us to the place of faith. It's important that we don't become so uh, accustomed to our doubts that we cease to fight through them toward a deeper walk with Jesus. As Christ says in Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find. Let me encourage you to seek and in your search 
you will certainly find. I've often said that doubt is the the kissing cousin of faith. One side of the, the, the same coin, faith on one side, doubt on the other, and there's that tension in our lives, but, but as, uh, as faith, as doubt rather doesn't so much drag us down, but catalyzes uh, us to, to, to turn to Christ, we find that our faith abounds all the more. Doubt will either drive us to despair or it will drive us closer to Christ. Frederick, Frederick Buechner calls doubt the ants in the pants of faith. Doubt keeps faith awake and moving. Jarius laid down his doubts and sought out Jesus. That connection brought, out, uh, brought about good things for, for him and for his daughter. He had gotten to the place where he could do no other but believe. He could do no other but to seek out Jesus. The woman did the very same thing. She was, she was so sure of, of Christ's power that she figured that all she needed to do was touch his garment. She too had gotten to the place of deep faith. The writer of Hebrews says this about faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. As we all know, as we all experience, sometimes on a daily basis with all that conspires to to drag us down, it is sometimes hard to muster the assurance, to muster the conviction necessary to be truly faithful. God stands to help us with that. I know he's done that with me and, and, and for me, even in times of doubt, God works to awaken us to his love. He's always about that. He's always at work to to refresh our lives, to refresh our lives with his love, to, to make us fully aware of the fact that he loves us to the very core. God honors us with his presence every time, every time we turn his way. And even when we don't turn his way, God is at work to make his presence known. It would be good for each of us to look for the ways that God is making his presence known in and through our lives. I love the story told of the man who was walking in a a jungle when he came upon a tiger. He began to run as as fast as as he could with the tiger close behind. And the tiger was, was catching up, and it wasn't long uh, before uh, the man came to a cliff. And again, this tiger is, is catching up. The man had a, had a decision to make, had a split-second decision to make. He could either be eaten by the tiger, or he could take his chances by jumping off the cliff. So the man chose the cliff. And as he, as he fell, he, he grabbed on to one of those trees that, that sometimes will, will jut outside the, the, the rock. And there the man was, hanging from that, uh, that tree, the, the tiger up above and a certain death below if he, if he fell all the way. Immediately the, the man began to yell, is, is there anybody up there? Is there anybody up there? He's, he's looking toward heaven. He continued to, to, to yell that out, is there anybody up there, until he heard a voice from heaven, yeah, what do you want? And it was that big, deep, sort of booming voice, and the man got the idea, well, th- this must be God. And, and so the, the, the Lord re- retorted, uh, or the man retorted, Lord, if, if, um, if I'll, I'll, I'll do anything, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do anything if you just save me. And there was a silence. And then the Lord responded, let go. And the man responded, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> James 1, 6 has this to say about doubt. But when we ask, we must believe and not doubt. 
because the one who doubts is like a wave of the, of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. You and I would do well to, to face our doubts head on, even, even struggle with them, all with an interest of laying them down so that we might know the power of faith over those doubts. Lay down your doubts as a great Lenten theme. It's the very thing that God wants us to do. It's the very thing that he wants us to do as we seek to glow, grow closer to Christ, the very one who, um, who wants to heal our lives. Just like Jairus' daughter, just like the woman with the, with the, with the hemorrhage, he, he longs to, to heal our lives, to make us whole, to, to make us complete in, in every way. The Lord wanted the man to let go. And I think uh, every one of us are challenged in that. There we are just kind of hanging between one danger and, and the other. We've already asked, I'll do anything. I'll do anything if, uh, if you just save me. And the Lord says, let go. And it really does challenge us. Are we, uh, are we ready? Are we willing to let go? To be full of trust, full of faith knowing that, that God will be there to catch us? Or are we like those that are asking the question, is there anybody else up there? And we're always seeking after other things, aren't we? But yet when it comes right down to it, the one immutable truth of all time, of all creation, is that God stands to be there for us, to express his love, to share his presence, to help us to get through even to heal to the very core of who we are. Fear not, I am with you, says the Lord. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. May God be with us all as we seek to move through our doubt to the place of deep faith, and in that, may we be healed and whole and the very people that God would have us to be. Let's pray together. And God, we do thank you for the blessedness of uh, your encouragement through your word. Lord, we pray uh, for strength in the midst of our doubt. We pray, Lord, that uh, you and the power of your spirit help us to move through our doubts to the place where we are believing, where we are full of trust, where we seek to let go and let you do your thing in us. Lord, we thank you that you provide the way through Christ. We thank you for the good news that is Christ. We thank you for this one who lived and died and rose again. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be given over to you through Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the promise of your love through him. Help us to believe, Lord. Even in our unbelief, help us to believe to the place where we know you in all fullness. This prayer we make in the name of Christ, amen. We invite you as we...